So let me begin by thanking our speakers for joining us today. Atul Bhalla joins us from Delhi, where he is Associate Professor at Shivnathar University. Atul's works combine photography, installation, video, sculpture, and performance to engage with urban and metropolitan spaces, in particular water systems, in his hometown, New Delhi. His work has been exhibited in museums and galleries in the United States, India, Europe, and Asia. Recent publications on Atul's work include Yamuna, Walk, published by the University of Washington Press, What, what Will Be My Defeat, Gallery for Land, Landschaftskunst, Hamburg, and You Always Step Into the Same River, published by the Vadera Art Gallery. And Atul has very generously provided us with copies of his books and mm -hmm. he's to take a look. Uh, following Atul's talk, we have an interdisciplinary conversation on the politics and aesthetics of water with Lauren Kreutz, Assistant Professor, History of Art Department, and Professor Robert Goldman, Catherine and William Magistrate Distinguished Professor in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. Uh, Lauren will speak about her recent project on the Hoover Dam. Uh, Lauren Kreutz focuses on modern art in the United States. She is particularly interested in the history and theory of photography and new media, race and ethnic studies, and the relationship between regionalism, nationalism, and globalism. Her recent work, Creative Composites, Race, Modernism, and the Stiglitz Circle, was awarded the 2010 Phillips Book Prize, and her talk today emerges from her new work on hydro projects in early 20th century United States. Professor Goldman's area of scholarly interest includes Sanskrit literature and literary theory. He has published widely in these areas, but he's perhaps best known for his work as the director, general editor, and principal translator of a massive and fully annotated translation of the Ramayana, which we are all greatly looking forward to. His work has been, <laughs> for many reasons, a lot of people are looking forward to it. His work has been recognized by several awards and fellowships, including election as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. But Bob does not need an introduction here or anywhere. Uh, the event itself is part of a series of conversations at History of Art and the Institute for South Asia Studies, broadly coalescing around the question of water. As you might know, Urban Wash is a recently launched initiative by the Institute it addresses the urgent water and sanitation issues in South Asia and was awarded the Obama Singh 21st Century Knowledge Initiative Award. Under this aegis, the Institute has organized a series of conversations and events, including a three-year project on sustainable water infrastructure in India. Today's panel, however, takes up the questions of aesthetics. Given the massive water crisis from California to Chennai, that affects more than 80% of the world's population today. The event is conceived as an intellectual laboratory to address the role art practice, literature, and art history can take up in face of environmental catastrophes. There is then something to be said about eco-aesthetics, as the, uh, evening, the panel title is. Rather than maintaining distinctions between the political, the environmental, and the technological, Eco-aesthetics allows us to comprehend the interconnectedness between the ecologies of the natural environment, human subjectivity, and social relationships to place water in an intrinsically interconnected field linked, to get linked through an interweaving of the human and the environmental. One aim, perhaps, of today's conversation is to examine the ways in which cultural, situational, and spatial practices destabilize the understanding of water as merely a natural resource to highlight sociologies of flow, contested environments, the politics and ethics of ritual practices, questions of purity and pollution, and new methodological possibilities that conjoin the ecological and the aesthetic. But what we might ask, does water have to do with aesthetics? I think what will come forth from today's uh, evening's diverse but interconnected interventions is an attempt to defamiliarize waterscapes by excavating their often neglected aesthetic dimensions. Indeed, we hope by focusing on the affect of water, its flow, its spaces, 
will allow us to move beyond politically conservative and nostalgic fetishization of the pristine. You might remember the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, who launched his campaign by the River Ganges in Varanasi. I'm grateful to the party for giving me opportunity to contest the election from the holy city of Varanasi with blessings of Ganga Ma and Kashi Vishwanath, Modi had tweeted. I do believe that reassessing hydro aesthetics for their critical potential would highlight how water can never be contained within such homogeneous constructions of nature, culture, and geoterrains. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you. Thank you for the University of Berkeley Institute of South Asian Studies and Sudhata for having me here today, and thank you, everyone. Good evening. Uh, and I'm not going to show tomorrow night. So <laughs> 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 uh, this, is, this is a kind of a longish kind of thing, but I'm just going to go one a little bit. And uh, <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> whatever. So uh, my work is an attempt. I mean, my work is an attempt to understand water, how I perceive it, feel it, eat it, drink it, wash in it, bathe in it, swim, wait, sink, or will drown in it. How I drench, soak, douse, moisten, quench, dilute, dampen, clean, or purify, how I excrete, tear, sweat, or use. How it falls, drops, floods, inundates, levels, boils, lashes, gushes, swells, and ripples. How it exists as fog, mist, cloud, steam, snow, sleet, rain, or puddle. How it contains, or is contained, how it is dammed or bottled. <coughs> the wake. A wake is an aftermath of a death, a vigil kept along with a body of someone who has died, sometimes accompanied by ritual observation. A boat hangs halfway between where it should be and where it might go, suspended in midair a moment before it may touch the water or not. It could also be a moment the boat ends its journeying and is liberated from its function, delivered, a moment of dilemma. A wooden boat midair awaiting its release, but which way? What happens when the river touches the city? Kanikanand recently asked after my solo in Delhi, which was titled Yagi Bichor, it's always about something else. <coughs> but does the city even want to touch its river? The boat, the boat came out of a commission project, a research and executed between 2012-13 for the Heritage Transport Museum, a public-private partnership just outside of Delhi. The installation of the museum is called the Wake. The Heritage Transport Museum inaugurated itself with a show curated by Priya Paul, of which <coughs> my commission was a part this year and a half project came out of my idiotic whim to get a boat made on the banks of the Yamuna in Delhi. The Yamuna is, uh, if not the one, but one of the most polluted rivers of the world, a river from which the city is totally disconnected, which can perhaps only see the river from, you can only perhaps see the river only from the five flyover bridges and that cross the river, but that too through the meshed barricades, like cage inhabitants looking out to an apparent open river scale. Almost all water that comes to the Wazirabad barrage, which is the north <coughs> northern part of the city, just inside, <coughs> is taken out to feed the greedy city along with a million of Qsecs which come from the Ganges Canal. The creator agreeing to my whim and trusting me in another of my attempts to immerse myself into navigating unfamiliar terrain, another attempt at interrogating the city through the trope of water, I started looking for boat makers <coughs> on the ghats of the Yamuna. Delhi has 25 ghats. Steps to the river, which were hidden from the public view, now by a wall, to protect the rest of Delhi from getting inundated as it did during the Great Flood of 1978. No one goes to the river just to sit or be by it, except the homeless, the small farmers, mostly Muslim, as the, <coughs> as the land belongs to the Chuhans and the Kujjas, settled nomads, who don't farm, don't essentially farm, but are essentially cow or buffalo herders. The Kujas rent out the small tracts of uh, farmland on the flood basin. And these urban farmers, working with the contaminated river water, produce contaminated vegetables, which again feeds the urban slums which line the river and the drains. 
that the only access to the river today becomes an access of death. The cremation grounds, like the Nikambod Ghat or the Kutsia Ghat, where the ashes of the cremated are immersed in the, in the waters. Mythically, the Yamuna is this supposed to be the sister of Yama, the god of death, and was supposed to have kept Yama away if you would bathe in her waters. But today, I think she contemplates her own death. Mm -hmm. But looking around <coughs> within the geographic confines of the territory of Delhi, I found one boatman who was repairing a small boat on the Ghat number 21. Most boats along the Yamuna belong to the flood department, which are hence made of factory made of aluminium or of fiber. All other boats are made of scrap metal and eucalyptus planks. And so the boat that we bought was being repaired. I asked the boatman where he came from and he said Garganga. The closest spot on the, Ga on the Ganges from Delhi, which is about 100, 105 kilometers away in UP. So next week visiting Garganga, I found Naresh repairing a boat and asked him if he had a built one. He said yes, three years ago at Ahar. I said, well, why would you want to show it to me? He said, give me my daily wages and I'll take you there. Mm -hmm. So he jumped in with me and off we went downstream to Ahar. Ahar, which is also a Gupta period archaeological site nestled between tall mounds and the river Ganges within a reserve forest at the river bank. Going through the reserve forest of Sal and Arjun trees, we came to a long sandy beach on the Ganges. And there, there was a boat in all its magnificence. We can take five dungars across. Now, dungars actually means buffaloes. You can take five buffaloes in the boat across the river. So it was a kind of a large boat. He initially agreed to work with me on the project and to build a traditional upper Ganges basin boat on the Yamuna. But then admitted that he did not know how. His brother knew. So we went to his brother who was a grocery, who runs a grocery store. And he said, no, I don't want to make boats anymore. It's not viable. He said from his grocery shop, you need only one boat and what do I do after? I lose all my clients and the business of the grocery store. Nobody wants boats anymore. I had wanted to work with the boat design and the craft of the upper Ganges Basin as I felt that the Kerala boats, the Kolkata and the Varanasi boats along with traditional boats of Tamil Nadu and Gujarat were in the people's imagination, but the boats from the upper Ganges Basin was not. And when I had shown pictures of this boat, which is the, called the Pattaya now, two people in Varanasi, they had never seen such craftsmanship. So it became even more interesting to find somebody to make this one. And I finally found a family of boat makers in the village Dhani, which is on the banks of the river Rapti, northwest of Gorakhpur. And the father Subhash, his son Rambhavan, and his maternal uncle, who was only called Mamaji, came to Delhi to work with me in building the boat on the banks of the most polluted river, the Yamuna. We were together for two months, sourcing special shisham wood, because we can't, we couldn't show, uh, source uh, saku, which is, uh, which is essentially used for water making wood, but Delhi, we couldn't get any, so we were made in shisham. Special long 12, 15 and 18 inch square nails, which were sourced <coughs> from the blacksmiths in Dhani itself. The boat was built without using any synthetic waterproofing, they, were, they used tree resin cross roots of the palash tree to fill in all the crevices in the boat. Subhash had dropped out of school and so had his son, but Subhash was extremely accurate in his calculation of amount of wood, the sizes, the thickness needed. I was really amazed at the calculation he did for setting the balance of the boat, angles and the curves of this 35 feet by 10 feet boat. Halfway along, I asked them to make an intervention. Could you do me an extra rudder? He said, okay. But I said, no, and the rudder on the other side. Well, how can you have a boat with two rudders? You will ha can't have a boat with two backsides. <laughs> but they were horrified. But, <coughs> uh, but I convinced them somehow, and they said, well, you can always take one off, and so can we just have it? So they finally just made it, probably. The museum had wanted to take uh, for the boat to be taken directly to the display as an object untouched by life and water. The boat makers and I insisted that the boat had to be taken to water, to the Yamuna, before it went to the museum. Mm -hmm. For the sake of its well-being and for the sake of the boat makers' well-being and their craft's well-being. The idea from the beginning had to be, had been to make a real boat. This obviously took some convincing at the museum, but they finally agreed. 
After prayers to four gods, the local village goddess, the whirlpool god, which I never knew existed, I have forgotten mm -hmm. the name of the whirlpool god, so excuse me for that, the river goddess and Vishukarma, the god, god for tools and labor, hand printing the boat's edge with a mixture of rice paste and water which had to be done by a woman, in this case Sushila, my Christian workmate, who eagerly joined in to leave a mark on the boat. The boat was finally taken to the river. Reaching this spot, <coughs> At, uh, which is the same spot where I immersed myself in the river for producing the work I was not waving but drowning which is on the poster that you see. I, Subhash the boat maker said aloud, Jamnaji is not flowing, Jamnaji is not flowing, the river is not flowing and he immediately understood why I had wanted two paddles on either side because if, if the <coughs> just like the Yamuna didn't flow so the boat with two rudders could only go in circles. So the river actually stops at Vazirabad and we take out our drinking water or all water. So the boat would only also go in circles at the same spot. So we christened the boat Yamini, night, very dark, after the river. And after more ceremonies for the, at the bank necessary for the long life of the boat and the boat met on water, Yamini was finally lowered into the still dark waters of the Yamuna at Vazirabad. We went around in circles. And the, stick, and the still waters of the Yamuna at Vazirabad and the, and the new boat that was quite a spectacle to the local farmers and villages <laughs> and none had ever in their memory seen such a crafted boat and a new one at that on the river. I am just going to go through the works and just quick and this is the deliverance, this is quite a large thing, it's called, this is Subhash, this is Ram Bhavan, this is Mamaji. With the nails, that's the <coughs> Palash tree root, and that's the brain going on. And this is before we left for the Yamuna, the four symbols, the four, four cords. And don't forget to notice the liquor bottle. <laughs> that was essential to the prayers. <laughs> and, that's the thing. and that's the extra rudder with Mamaji holding it with it and then putting it on. And that's the boat into the water. And it's quite a large boat, which mm -hmm. just gives you an idea of. Oops, sorry, I have done something. Yeah. That's the one with the two runners. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, I also visited the village, and uh, that's how I got them. These are just shots of the village, and I'll show you why, even there, they have a new bridge. This is the father of Subhash. This is the village, it has no electricity. And this is their home, and his father explaining me how to make the boat. Okay. Like this. How to actually make a boat in the river there. And obviously, these are the fields around, and plenty of embankments, so this area floods quite a bit from quite close to Nepal, not far away from Lumbini. And uh, during the monsoon, it floods, so the boat, boats are still needed. But now, what has happened is, this is Chacho. Now they have a bridge. So the boat making is not viable anymore for them again. So, and you can notice the pontoon in the right corner, uh, that was what was used during monsoon, but now they, since they have a bridge, so the boat is now used for illegal sand mining, just like the other. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is at the mm -hmm. <coughs> Heritage Transport Museum. This is how it is displayed at the Heritage Transport Museum. So if you're in Delhi and sometime, and you're going towards Jaipur, it's on the way, you turn left, it's about six kilometers off the highway. It's a quite an impressive uh, museum and there's a cafe underneath, so you have a kind of quote unquote underwater cafe we can <laughs> have. <laughs> uh, and these are the, things. so they have image, the plexi waves and stainless steel waves have images of uh, ghats around Delhi and on the thing. Just to give you an idea of what it was. 
quite a it was a one and a half year project and that's just to give you an act the size is mean photographing the work. This is the boat again. And this <coughs> actually and then this work was finally displayed at the solo that I was talking of 2014. And you have the work displayed there with the images of the boat making becoming a part of an artwork uh, there. And uh, and what happened was uh, I was looking for a title and I was yeah <coughs> how what to call it and I came across uh, a little in the Mahabharata I've been influenced by the Mahabharata a number of works but then I came across something called Dvapayana. Now Dvapayana is I'm just going to read out this thing. According to the sacred texts uh, called Quran, the sage Parashar reaches Kalindi, the Yamuna River in North Delhi, and wishes to cross it. He looks around and finds a fisherman's boat. Parashar asks Satyavati, the fisherman's daughter who is on the boat at the time, to take him across the river. Since her father is occupied elsewhere, Satyavati agrees. While on the boat, the sage cannot take his eyes off the young woman and asks if he can make love, make love to her. She agrees, and the myth has it that these clouds actually cover them up, and so that nobody can see their love making. And well, and they conceive a child. So the the child conceived on the boat, a male child born on an island on the Yamuna, is named Krishna Vipayan Vyas, the dark one from the island. Or where Vyas, how is later come from? Because Krishna means dark. And Dvapayan comes from the word Dvip, it means surrounded by water. And with <coughs> uh, when Vyas is known to have compiled the Vedas and the Mahabharata epic, Dvapayana also features as a lake in the last episode of the Great War. The Mahabharata, the, insti the instigator of the war king Duryodhana, takes refuge in this lake, which in turn covers him in ice. The, this eases the king's fatigue and the sense of loss and wrongdoing. The epic narrates that he can emerge from the Vapayana only by his own volition. And no one can force him out of the outer power. In the Mahavata, King Duryodhana hides within the lake, which is also the creator, author, artist himself. Thus, perhaps, the Vapayana becomes the mythical lake from which we may all be and from which we might derive ourselves. L so, this work. Which, which you see in front of me, this was called from the Vapayana. There were some objects, there's a vitrine full of water, a column, wooden column, and some other objects. And and then there was a small photograph on the left hand side, which you can see, which I'll show you a larger image, which is called to the Vapayana. This work was called from the Vapayana. And then when you, these are the objects, and these are the objects I found along the river, either at Banaras or at the Yamuna, um, usually on my travel to a number of other rivers. And you can also find a name, which is supposed to be auspicious on the thing. And I also gave out uh, car bumper stickers, which were called, did you stand for the same river? Right? And this was how it was laid out, but you entered the show through a video of a boat coming in, which is a three channel video, you entered a dark space. There was a boat coming in from one side and then on the other side is carrying another something else and then another boat carrying something else then the boat <coughs> then you're actually surrounded by water this work was called on Vapayana and the boat suddenly catches fire this was and this work is currently is going to be shown at the light box gallery at Harvard Art Museum it's on the 31st to be 16th of April I guess and, it's, yeah. and this is called, but this is the image that I, which I'm currently <coughs> working on. And this work I suddenly rechristened as Looking for the Vapayana, Looking for Lost Water in Delhi. I perform at locations named after or named after or for water within my home city, Delhi. Old wells, step wells, some old water bodies like old wells have been covered over to make way for roads or to ease the traffic. Some remain only within the consciousness and memory of the older generations, referring to a water body lost to time or to greed. 
माई बॉडी द बॉडी माई बॉडी हेयर प्ले द इंडेक्सिकल रोल ऑफ पर हैव वॉन्टिंग और अटेम्पटिंग टू कनेक्ट विद द लेबरिंग ऑफ वाटर टेबल सोर्स इज दैट की दिडियल आई द साइट्स आर प्लेसिस विच मे स्टिल कैरी नेम्स अबाउट वाटर बॉडीज लाइक द छप्पर वाला खू दिस इज द जमुना एक्चुअली दिस इज द बाबर पुल विच इज इफ यू गो अप टू नजरगढ़ विलेज and go up to dhansa ban there is a small river that comes there which is called the sahvi river which is now the najagar drain which was it is yamuna river which is really a river river emerging uh, source in the jhajjar hills and there is a is all this uh, bridge is built with small bricks just like most of old delhi is so and they call it babar's bridge so but there is no evidence for that i have no idea of that i'm not in story but that's what the village is called so the river actually went on and it is made it has the arches and it kind of does that this me again morning there this is lal kuwa in delhi old delhi i don't know if you're familiar with lal kuwa lal kuwa is a very historical site because that's also a police post there which says amun committee and that was the position where in the rights of 1970s he kept the muslims and the hindus separate so in lal kuwa and it's also famous for this is the janta piao just side side old delhi railway station it was it's still there but now they it was there till 2 years ago but now they covered it and they actually extract water with a pump till 2 years ago you could actually go see the well but if you ask him they can still see it and interesting to have those symbols in the current circumstances <laughs> and uh, this is the dhansa uh, border this is the border of delhi with haryana and this is the sahibi river coming under it this is the dhansa band band means dam and this is the chappad wala khu chappad wala khu in punjabi means thatched well and all immigrants to west delhi except the krolbag and patel nagar tapal nagar all gave directions from this well they would even my grandmother used to say you go to chappad wala khu and then you turn left and go for another film and you go to film istan or you go to old delhi or azad market or something like so it became a very important landmark it's the well still exists but in cover over with concrete the well is still there so very few people actually know about it at chapawala ko you ask the old people the shop people they would know but the new ones no one would know now this is the gandak ki bawli <coughs> nahi rajaon ki bawli in mehroli so this is also another mark mark and it has me again Almost at last. This is uh, Panchmiya Road, the five well road, Old Delhi. Uh, not Old Delhi, Central Delhi, just about a few hundred meters from Kanam Place. This is how the work was displayed, and uh, this is Victor Sir. You say everyone has their own way of drawing. Do I have more time? No. Now I'm actually done with this. So I can I can show more work if, okay. if I want. I can. Uh, okay. So one more. One more work. Okay. Uh, this is called Listen of the West Heavens, and uh, this was a Chetanya Samrani's curation and a project, India-China project, in which we were the curator had notes said taking off on each other's cultures with the least possible reference to the West. in fact this if that were possible mm -hmm. and uh, so the uh, they invited a chinese artist to india and indian artist to china and we took off on each other and i uh, because they have been uh, as far as i know i'm not in historia may be wrong but as i don't think in the, there have been very many indian travelers i don't think there have been any indian travelers which have gone outside of the subcontinent they have been travelers within india but they have definitely been chinese travelers to india which have no the one so i became this traveler from india who was listening listening to water as repository of history meaning and myth and then this is right and i took off on jung chang's book the retreat daughters of china world swans and the and on mao's red book and i changed the text uh, three of my works got censored these were shown in shanghai and the original text would say two red sandwiching a black black is someone who would not conform to party to the party which we are currently going on i don't know what's happening in there in india as well but and then uh, i'm that's why the whole work was framed in black and i'm also wearing black and i'm listening to water which are locations within the inner ring road of shanghai uh, 
where 42 locations which are named still after water, but their water doesn't exist. China, Shanghai was almost like Venice. A lot of canals, a lot of harbors, a lot of boat, uh, movements on boats. And, uh, so this was the first work. Then you are being protected. That's what Mao said. So I changed it. You are being protected to consume. And this woman almost hit me in the head. We had a, she wouldn't, she didn't change. We had the video and we had the camera and everything else, but she walked right through and thought I should include her. This was supposed to be a canal there and this was supposed to be a bridge over it, but it doesn't exist. So it's also about listening to water as history, meaning and myth. This is outside the customs house. So Mao said, father is close, mother is closer, but neither is as close as Chairman Mao. So I changed it to a Gucci. And then you had thought reform through suffering. I changed it to consumption. And consume first and suffer, uh, suffer, destroy first and suffering and construction will take care of itself. So I changed it to consume first. This was also censored. The three works are censored. They said you cannot use the word red flag, you can't use the word construction, and you can't use the word communist. I, but you can't, I asked why, and they said we don't have any answers, but you can't argue them. So, and I'll show you how I kind of, and then wave the consumer flag to write the flag. This was censored as well. And all of these locations, this is outside the 1921 location in Shanghai where they, they declared the Republic of China, uh, and Mao there, and, uh, and they decided to go on the long march. So I, Li Feng was a fictitious connector that Mao invented. So Li Feng is eating at McDonald's today. So this was not censored somehow. <laughs> and then you have, you're going through a test and suffering will make you a better communist. I changed it to consuming. And employ to consume but under control and uh, surveillance. And uh, at the back you can, they are still exercising to, to certain, you know, nationalistic music and dance and everything. And con and Execution has to extend to cousins nine times removed. I change it to consumption. And then Mao, as you know, said the more you read, the stupid you become. So I change it to the less you consume, the stupid you become. And again, and then this is how it was displayed. If you read, look at the front one, it has two, just two red inverted commas. This was the one that was censored. The other ones I displayed because I did not want anybody else to get in trouble. So I just censored. I didn't, you know, I didn't kind of withdraw from the show. I would actually show it, right? Uh, so this is how it was shown there, and this is another example of it. So I just finish with this. I should not go ahead. Thank you, but I would want to end with all water has perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it was. That's Tony Morrison. And climatically, the amount of fresh water remains the same, or is actually going down from our water with our environmental interventions. So when I step into the Yamuna, the river, any river, I always step in the same. Mm -hmm. Thank you. not a South Asianist, so I am grateful to be welcomed here today. Attentive listeners, will this library thing go away? Okay. Attentive listeners will notice that I took this title from the work that Bella just presented. He draws our attention, I think, to the ways that human settlement shapes and is shaped by rivers. One of the most spectacular ways this containment happens in the 20th and 21st century is the mega dam. So here I show you a website for a dam currently being constructed on the Upper Yamuna River, which you probably know far more about than me. It's a little bit dangerous for me to show it, but we can talk about it together. Since the 1970s, such projects have been the sites of huge protests. Here's just a few from the Indian context about this dam. These protests have drawn attention to the negative impacts on nature and the site's human inhabitants whose studies have shown are disproportionately indigenous and poor. We can date the beginnings of this modern age of mega dam building 
to the late 1920s and 1930s, particularly the construction of the massive Hoover Dam. Here I show you a contemporary view of the project. And a map showing it's located just outside of Las Vegas. And here, just in case, I got very lost in the geography of Delhi. So here's the geography of America. <laughs> um, here it is in relationship to San Francisco, where we are here. So the dam started construction in 1931, and it captivated the United States. In the decades that followed, more than 400,000 large dams have been built across the globe. In the 1930s, we see dams all over the visual and material culture of the United States. For example, the Fort Peck Dam looms large on the first cover of Life magazine, issued on November 23, 1936. In my discipline, the history of American art, Margaret Bork White's black and white photograph has become a similarly dominant presence, regarded as a kind of icon of the machine age. Bork-White captured this image on an assignment from life to cover Depression-era New Deal construction in Northeast Montana. I don't have a map of Montana, but it's like north, east. <laughs> Fort Peck, the largest of these projects, was to become the world's most massive earth-filled dam, a potent symbol of a new period of national power on a global scale. Our historians have focused on the humans in Borkwit's Depression era scene, and you see them down here. These men hunched over and dwarfed by the crenellated towers. And our historians have focused on these in order to think largely about issues of labor. But this image, I want to claim, also envisions the power created by harnessing and displacing nature. A high horizon line of the concrete structure eliminates both water and earth to become a kind of monument against the sky. And in our own era of ecological precarity, I think we need to look anew at the ruptures we might find in this machine age modernism that envisions a domination of nature. We can see the geological influences that escape Fort White's Fort Peck. In October of 1938, Life published a subsequent account illustrated by these photographs, which reported that, quote, quietly and without warning, on September 22nd, the packed back of dirt and rock, which made up the eastern end of Fort Peck across the Missouri River at Fort Peck, Montana, began to slide. In about eight minutes, 8 million cubic yards of earth had slipped off the upstream face of the biggest dirt dam in the world, out into the reservoir that it had backed up. Then the slide came to rest. Buried in it were the corpses of eight workers, a pump barge, four tractor cranes, five tractors, and two trucks. And two. Alongside this narrative of the accident, which couldn't be explained by engineers, Life published these two photographs. You want the lights down, or is everybody happy with this? Down. Can we turn the lights down a little bit? It's not, I mean, they're by no means like masterpieces of photography, but. In the first four, in the first, well, that might be two there. In the first, four small, uh, four small <laughs> parallel pillars. Here, I'll just go to, I can go to a bigger image. Okay. Yeah, That's great. Right. Sorry, I feel like, like a total art historian was it. In the first, four small parallel pillars, which you see here, mark the human presence and planning in the foreground, balanced just in front of a deep crater, which you can see here, huge, whose irregular outline interrupts the linear shore. In the second photograph, taken from an aerial vantage, a series of textual labels attempt futilely to narrate and contain the immense power of the earth. Ultimately, I think both photographs suggest the ways nature might escape human mastery and evade visual inspection, calling perhaps for a kind of somatic engagement <coughs> that we see in Bala's work. We might best understand the river by seeing it with our eyes closed, by being in it with our eyes closed. And this is an idea that's very scary to me as an art historian, 
whose job often seems to be looking at things. But I'm working through it with an essay on a little known Colorado muralist named Alan Tupper True, who was employed by the US Bureau of Reclamation in 1936. And this is the bureau that's in charge of all the dams in the West. They're reclaiming the earth. So Tupper True's job was to harmonize the Hoover Dam with its desert environment through colors and patterns that he derived from the traditions of local Native American tribes who were displaced by the dam. Truce is a project that I think fails in many, many ways, but I think it's also instructive for considering what an eco-aesthetics might mean. In December of 1935, this issue of Science Newsletter noted Truce's wide-ranging wide palette of 10 colors ranging from concrete gray to canary yellow and vermilion. And he's painting the architecture of the Hoover Dam inside and also all the machines at the dam. And these colors were intended to invoke, they said, Navajo rugs and Pueblo ceremonial sashes, the colors of the Native American tribes indigenous to the area around the dam. The magazine reported that True had based the, fixtures, the features of his design, this design that you see here, on, quote, a prehistoric Indian bowl found on the site to be submerged by the new lake. And they read the iconography, which included a symbol for lightning, the step-like figures, clouds, and water. They read this in relationship to the local natural surroundings. So True is using hues and symbols explicitly derived from local, local Native American traditions and tied to the site. He proposed that the massive machinery of the dam complex could fit harmoniously in nature even as it radically remade the landscape. In his own article in Reclamation Era, the astounding journal of the Bureau of Reclamation, True heralded the use of designs derived from the Pueblo tribes along the Colorado River. As he said, quote, the most significant and appropriate innovation of his project. And here I'll give you just a few enlargements of those figures. He trumpeted his source as wholly untouched and potentially superior, he said, to overused classical motifs. If given, quote, discriminating adaptation. Implicitly, of course, adaptation by himself, a European-trained Anglo-American artist. True noted the easy adaptation of forms at a symbolic level. He said that the centrifugal movement from designs on baskets and bowls suggested links with, quote, what occurs in the power plant when the rush of water is converted into electrical energy, end quote. He also gave specific tribal affiliations for his adapted Pueblo designs. In, this, in a kind of quick sequence, I'm going to show you his designs alongside their ethnographic counterparts. I think he's getting them from. So True noted references here to Mimbres pottery, in these to Pima baskets, and in these to Acoma storage bowls. So this list of Native American sources in the Colorado River watershed provides a sense of the temporal capaciousness of true sources. Archaeologists date the Mimbris culture, I'll show you their examples here, to a brief period from 1100 to 1150 CE, while the Pima and Acoma people lived in the area as the Hoover Dam was being built. In his article, True noted that some of the designs he used, quote, grace the primitive bowls and shards of ancient pueblos, which are being submerged by the waters of the Colorado as the dam backs them up in the valley to the Grand Canyon, end quote. So his text here mentions the dam's destruction or covering over of important cultural artifacts, but it seems to regard that ruin of the ancient, of the primitive, as inevitable. True's article concluded with the statement that, quote, 
Much of the sensitive yet virile appreciation of form and color survives among the contemporary Pueblo Indians. And it is planned to utilize the talents of some of the best of them when the final wall decoration is done, end quote. So here, true position contemporary Native Americans as inheritors, but in a kind of vague formal sense that didn't give them claim of ownership over the landscape in which they lived, or with the designs that they're, with the landscape in which they lived and with their designs so well harmonized. So what I'm trying to say is that he gives them claim over the form, but not over the landscape, or over the landscape through their designs. So from the beginning, True's project provokes questions about artistic identity and ethnic ownership within the federal government. Months after submitting sketches, True learned his appointment had not been approved because the Secretary of the Interior believed an Indian artist should be selected. And this suggestion is surprising in the context of the history of American art, given the scholarship on the many ways that the Hoover Dam exploited Native Americans, even as they were completely left out of work on the project. Others in the Bureau of Reclamation suggested plans for a competition among Native Americans, to be judged, of course, they said, by quote, competent artists implying that Native Americans could not themselves assess their work. Memos and correspondence in True's paper show a gradual displacement of Native American artists from the dam project, justified in a language of efficiency, and I think more surprisingly, a language of visual harmony. True repeatedly attempted to secure Native American assistance. His papers include a handwritten list of names organized by tribe, However, he also demanded assurances from his superiors that, quote, work done by Indians shall be subject to my direction and unquestioned control, to the end that all work executed shall be harmonious, end quote. Ultimately, no collaboration occurred. The harmony of True's project displaced Native Americans even as it pointed to them, suggesting the uneven effects of social suggesting the uneven social and ecological effects of damming. So True continued working for the Bureau of Reclamation at Grand Coulee Dam in the Columbia Basin in Washington State. He deployed there the final color scheme, which you see here. She developed in 1940, again, based on local Native American artifacts, he says. At Grand Coulee is where I think True and Borkwhite's work intersects. So Borkwhite shot this arresting photograph of the site, of the dam site for Life magazine. The caption informs viewers that these tubes are filled with a cooling brine, which freezes the earth in order to prevent a landslide during construction. So here I think Borkwhite presents us with a kind of unruly, unharmonious image of man's control over land. However, True's work suggests the way that our aesthetic harmony, aesthetic order, might also dominate that landscape and its inhabitants. The dam ended, the Grand Coulee Dam, ended 6,000 years of salmon fishing on the site. And in this photograph, you see local Colville Federated tribes gathering nearby the dam to hold what they call the Ceremony of Tears in June of 1940, instead of their usual <coughs> celebration of the spring salmon run and life renewal. Ultimately, I think True's work for the Bureau of Reclamation suggests the ways that visual harmony and order, although they're often prized by artists and art historians, may actually foreclose effective and affective integration into the natural ecosystem. <coughs> so what I want to end by saying is that perhaps eco-aesthetics calls for an art history that closes our eyes in order to exceed the optical. Thank you.
So I thought I would start at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and what was the beginning? Uh, and I want to talk about the, the uh, deep reverence for, concern for, aesthetic uh, con uh, construction and metaphysical construction of water as the kind of example of the primordial, what, what the world comes out of, what the world goes back to. Agre praketam salilam sarvam idam surigveda. In the beginning, this means this world, this universe, was all nothing but water. Echoed in the Taitariya Sanhita, which is a text of the Black Yajur Veda. Right? Apo vaidam agre salilam asi. There was only this in the beginning, water. It was an ocean. And, and the aestheticization of, of Water is kind of interesting too. So it's a verse from uh, uh, an 8th century play by the Sanskrit poet Bhavabhuti, uh, who's talking about rasa. Rasa in the sense of aesthetic sentiment, but rasa also means water. He was talking with Batu before how, how many words there are for water in Sanskrit, probably more than there are for snow in Eskimo language. <laughs> there is only one sentiment, rasa, fluid, the compassionate. There's only seem to be many because of different circumstances. It is like water. Although it has eddies, bubbles, and waves, it's all still just water. And the universe came out of water. And once we get into the devotional period, this post-Vedic period, this is the great deity, uh, Lord Vishnu Narayana. He is shown as Shesha Shai, resting on a cosmic serpent who rests on the primordial ocean. And when the time for a recreation of the world occurs, then a lotus, the most fitting thing would be the BJP poster out of this today, <laughs> a lotus arises from the navel, from the nexus of Lord Vishnu, out of which arises the creator deity, Brahma. So here you see again this kind of a, a, a devotionalist uh, attitude toward the primordial ocean. And many of the myths of creation uh, in Hinduism and related religions have to do with things coming from the primordial ocean. This is a very familiar one, the churning of the ocean for the things of the world, the primordial ocean. Now, embodying the two deep concerns of the culture, water and dairy products. <laughs> <laughs> cows, there's a lot of sentiment for cows. So here the gods and the demons, gods on the right side, demons on the left, are churning the ocean uh, with a mountain as its churn stick, and it begins to sink into the primordial ooze. And Lord Vishnu, who you also see seated at the top of the mountain, uh, now turns himself into a giant sea turtle, which you may have seen on Sproul Plaza today. They're trying to save the sea turtles and from this kind of abuse, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, including the goal, which is the nectar, the essence of the essence, which is the rasa of the rasa, which is the amrita, which is the stuff of life. Right? And then, of course, the cooperation between the gods and the demons breaks down, and they start fighting with each other. And that, too, has a whole history, uh, because where the drops of the nectar fell uh, become the holy sites at which the, uh, the so-called kumbh melas are held because of the nectar. There you go. Thank you very much. Here's another picture of the same uh, thing. Again, you see all these things, the white elephant, the dinga, and so on, the multi-headed horse and so forth. And many of the representations of deity are, are aqueous, right? Here's uh, the first of the avatars, the so-called dashavatars of, of Vishnu. It's a fish. It's a whole story about a fish, God becoming a fish uh, and saving the world. And here he is with a fish being sheltered by a naga, which is here an aqueous creature, uh, and uh, holding the lotus in his hand. And go back to the source. You were talking about the Yamunaji, right? This is uh, Yamunotri in the uh, Himalayas, which, which is the source of the sacred goddess uh, Yamuna. This is the temple uh, at the site. And here, in the pristine form, is Yamunaji, not this polluted river that Atul was talking about in Delhi. This is the pristine beginnings of Yamunaji and in her journey to what finally becomes uh, of her cascading down to this lush, uh, lush Himalayan valley past the, uh, the temple at the, at the source. And there she is, the goddess, because the river is a goddess, not just a river. And there she is with her 
partner, her sister, so to speak, Gangaji and Yamunaji, the two great riverine goddesses of uh, Hinduism represented on their respective mounts, uh, the crocodile for Gangaji and the turtle again for uh, Yamunaji. But this is a living goddess. This is actually, you can't see her too well, but she's in there. This is uh, Yamunaji at Ranachati in the Himalayas, not too far from uh, uh, Yamunotri. And at this time of year that this was in the summer, they bring the goddess down in that palki. And they go from the temple to temple, and the people there become possessed by the goddess, and particularly the women. So there's this deep involvement with the river, with the goddess. And here these women are, as they say, you know, they're playing, but means they're possessed by the goddess and showing their bowen group, as they call it, their, their wind form. In other words, these women have become the goddess now, have absorbed the river. So it's a kind of fascinating thing. And they go into these ecstasies, and you can see the hair flying out. This woman has collapsed in ecstasy and so on. And so all the people are doing this. But there's this deep love of the river. This is the Yamuna in uh, Delhi during the Chat Festival, very popular among Biharis and Nepalis, in, in which people, in their love of the river, perform this puja to the sun. But it's a case in these places of actually literally loving the river to death. <laughs> because all of this stuff, the offering, gets chucked into the river. So there's a massive uh, problem, pollution. This can read you a very short passage from this very interesting book about Delhi by the novelist uh, Rana Dasgupta. He's walking along the uh, northern part of the Yamuna in Delhi with a kind of activist, uh, the Sanupam Mishra, you may, know, you may know this guy. He's talking, think of, think of religious immersion. It is not just superstition, it is a practice of water preservation. If our prime minister had to immerse himself in the Yomana every year, it would be a lot cleaner than it is now. <laughs> but everyone has turned their backs on the river in obedience to the modern city, and so it is filthy and forgotten. We walk down to the river's edge. The water is black and chemically alive. It heaves muddily with bubbles erupting from its depths. Looking across its expanse, however, one can only see the mirror of the sky and there's a satisfying feeling of river and peace. Some 20 meters from the bank is a large statue of Shiva, submerged up to its shoulders. Egrets flip over the surface. This is the final painting in a grand uh, series of illustrations of the Valmiki Ramayana uh, by the um, artists at the, uh, the court, uh, the Mewar court of Jagat Singh, about 1650 of the common era, a very densely illustrated thing, which you can get uh, it's, if you go onto the British Library site, you can get it and scroll through it. So this is the immersion, because at these festivals, of course, at the, what happens to the end of, uh, of the deities? They're immersed in the river, of course, further polluting it, but that's another matter. But this is the original scene. This is the, uh, the end of the Rama Vatara. You can see Rama there. It's followed by the entire population, the animals, the people of his kingdom returning to heaven. So here everyone is immersing themselves, drowning themselves, as uh, uh, blissfully drowning themselves in the holy Sarayu river at the Gopratara Tirta. And then they're ascending to heaven in these little, nice little boats that uh, somebody had built for them down by the river, right, that Otto knows all about. And here they have lots of boats, and these are flying boats which are cool, and uh, <laughs> they're literally uh, ascending to the heavens as the gods uh, watch them. It's this beautiful thing. It's another version of it. Uh, same picture, actually, but this, this is the scene. Um, but th there's a great fascination with bodies of water in the aesthetic side, and I just want to show a, little, a few uh, little scenarios from different passages in the epic. Um, there's the standard beautiful body of water. This is Lake Pampa from the fourth book of the Ramayana as it is um, watched by Rama, right? The son of Dasharatha, and he's lovelorn now, his wife has been taken away. He sick with grief as he entered Lake Pampa through its covering of lotuses. There were pleasant groves clustered around the lake, brilliant with pilikas, ashokas, punnagas, bakulas, and udalas. These are different plants, flowers. Its water was choked with lotuses, but brimming and crystal clear, with turtles and schools of fish. The beaches were of soft sand, and there were beautiful trees upon the banks. 
vines growing twined about them like fast friends. It was the haunt of Kinneras, serpents, Gandharvas, Yakshas, all these different creatures. A lovely treasure house of cool water surrounded by all kinds of trees and vines, and so on and so forth, you can see. So this is a kind of classic scenario of, of, of a, an idealized scene of the river. This can also be eroticized, as you see. Here's the Narmada River, as described in the, in the uh, seventh book, of, as Ravana, the demon king, prepares to bathe in it. The ten-faced bull among Rakshas has descended quickly from the Pushpaka. That's his flying car. Then just as one might enter the embrace of a lovely and beloved woman, he immersed himself in the Narmada, the foremost of rivers, which had blossoming trees for a chaplet, a pair of chakravakas, it's birds, for breasts, broad banks for hips, a line of hamsas, swans, you could say, for a lovely girdle, a body smeared with pollen and foam of the water for a white mantle a plunge into its waters for an embrace, and blooming lotuses for lovely eyes. Afterward, seated on its charming bank, which was adorned with all kinds of flowers, the lord of the Rakshasas, together with his ministers, took pleasure in the sight of the, of the yeah, Narmada. So here's this, this feminization, an erotization of the water, of the river. You know, it becomes almost a sexual act. But this, this charm of, of water can be reversed. Water can be frightening. And, if, and you can see now how the poet spins this by using this stock kind of metaphor of water to describe something very ugly. This is the battle scene at Lanka in the sixth book. Indeed, the battleground resembled a river. Masses of slain heroes formed its banks and shattered weapons its great trees. Torrents of blood made up its broad waters, and the ocean to which it flowed was Yama, the god of death. Livers and spleens made up its deep mud. Scattered entrails, its water weeds, Severed heads and trunks made up its fish, pieces of limbs its grass. It was crowded with vultures in place of flocks of hamsas, and it was swarming with adjutant storks, either carrion eaters, instead of sarasa cranes. It was covered with fat in the place of foam, and the cries of the wounded took the place of its gurgling. It was not to be forded by the faint of heart. Truly, it resembled a river at the end of the rains, swarming with hamsas and sarasa cranes. <coughs> So uh, this is, you know, just I wanted to do a little bit of a snapshot about the way in which water has been deeply implicated into both the religious, philosophical thought of uh, traditional India and deeply implicated as well into the aesthetic uh, value of it. So I think I'll leave it at that and uh, we can go on to a discussion. about this whole idea of today, of this massive geological transformation that has led to cataclysmic droughts and cataclysmic climate change. And, uh, and as it is argued, the only way we can live is to die. Uh, death is the only way forward for humans, in, in this, for this planet to survive. Uh, in that sense, thinking about the death of the river, or even the death of culture in that sense. And what, what emerges here is the question of optics, of seeing. So I wonder if, if death and seeing, and how do you see death, death of the ecosystem, the death of those wells that you were excavating that do not exist anymore, the death of culture, the de death of river. I wonder if that could be one way of thinking eco aesthetics from our vantage point of today in what is, what is a global capitalist transformation that will destroy the planet that it, as we move forward. So I wonder if that is something you well, yes, I mean, the point is that uh, this is that the, the notion is that uh, water will, it, it is death in a way, it will absorb us. We all will go, it's materially like scattering the ashes, as you see. Or in the end, by a grand 
cataclysmic pralaya of uh, flood. So the, the, then the metaphor of escape becomes uh, this kind of uh, otherworldly notion of escaping the ocean. The ocean becomes samsara. This again is becoming metaphor, right? So salvation is constantly metaphorized as uh, how to get over the ocean, how to be saved from drowning. You know, uh, uh, Ramanujan did that thing, a hymn for the drowning, uh, or you know, carrying, or a boat carrying you to the far shore of samsara, that the ocean becomes this kind of uh, menacing thing that uh, will one day come and get us in, in, in the way you're talking about, which is actually happening now with the rise in sea levels, the melting of the polar ice caps, you know, the crashing of the glaciers and disappearance, you know, eventually uh, it's all just water, right? And that becomes the metaphor of, of all of us. Akasha patitam poyam sagaram pratidachati. The water falls from the heaven and it goes to the sea. And there's also an interesting, I can say in the Mahabharata, in the Jakshpashna, mm -hmm. five princes in anxiety, mm -hmm. they reach a body of water and they want to drink with a voice that comes from water. Before you drink, answer my question. The younger princes die, and Yudhishthira says, examine me. Now, the thing is that he's been examined by water. So what, I mean, that's been fascinating for me, and a number of words have come out of that. But the question that are asked is, you know, it's like, what is quicker than the wind? It's, it's thought in what can, what can cover the earth. So I kind of took off from that, and what can cover the earth in an environmental catastrophe would be water. Right. <coughs> what, uh, what, who are more numerous than living or dead, he says living. And give me an example of space, he says my two hands is one. Example of grief, ignorance, of poison, desire. So all there are a number of 54 questions, and then go to Peter Brooks, Mahamara, they like it, Raghav Carrier, scriptures, about 15 questions. Mm -hmm. So this, um, the idea is that the, you have to answer to water. So, you know, it's right. <laughs> so it's an interesting uh, thing that you, you know, without mm -hmm. that answering or that connection, you will not get, you won't get the answer. So, mm -hmm. kind of an interesting thing. And in the Cooper Dam context, it's like, in the damming, the mega dams of the 1930s, it's like this constant attempt, attempt to try to figure out some way to engineer over death, like, but it's always with human laborers. So like, they have a really big problem because the Hoover Dam's in the middle of the desert and they're trying to do it during the summer. So they have people dying because they don't have anything to drink. Like, it's a really, it's a strange doubling of uh, like the human labor. Uh, so I see why people have talked so much about labor, but there then is a kind of lack of nature in the project too, because they're working to contain nature but they contain it like so well that they no longer have access to it themselves. And it's fun it's interesting now because what we're seeing is a failure of oh, these good. projects. So like these projects are old now and a lot of the mega dams either never got built, got built on really faulty foundations, and so now they're like starting to crumble and so there's a threat, a new kind of threat of flood that's like a really spectacular threat of flood. Right. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Oh, it's very interesting when we talk of sacred and dams in America. But I think it's a very famous uh, Jawala Nehru's quote that dams are modern Indian temples, something like that. So he did connect the most sacred um, structure to dams. And I think it's still used. I think it was used by some artists also. I don't know if you used it. No, I don't really. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very interesting. And also the aspects of water, and you talked of it being as, uh, you know, sexual. The rivers are always being pregnant in mythology and having these children, and then they go on to become great sages or rakshasas or someone great. <laughs> so it's very interesting that it's And they that tend to be feminized. Yeah. Most of All them are feminine. Yeah. Yeah, less, I was trying to think if it's the same in, in this in the thirties context at least it's about overcoming the river, which is a kind of masculine, mm -hmm. unwieldy so yeah. and associated associated with Native Americans who are then maybe also slightly feminized. But river is always feminized, so I don't know. In the South Asian context. South Asian context, context, context. So maybe in the American context or in the I don't know. Not entirely. 
I mean, rivers that flow north to south. I used the Bamaputra. Rivers that flow north to south are masculine. I think it's the only one. Yeah, the only one. It's not the only one. The rivers that flow north to south, of which there are very few, are generally masculine. Rivers that flow east to west are generally regarded as the same. Gosford, in case you want to get technical. Well, I'm just curious about the idea of answering the law and solving problems. I've been I work on ocean law, so it's a little bit out, out there, but I'm interested in this concept of submerged land, which I think is actually like refusing to answer to water. So, and, and you're dealing so much with all these covered waterways and the echoes of them, and when you answer to them is when, you know, the, the water returns to where, to where it was, mm -hmm. and it tends to do that with these flood states, and mm -hmm. it doesn't care what the, the human, human overload is, so it's this interesting kind of uh, tension, I think, in terms of just how it works conceptually and politically and, uh, and in terms of the built environment, which is that the notion that just because water is there doesn't mean that the land beneath it is not to be to be utilized, to be raised up. Or, and even if you look at the U.S. Geologic Survey in the 30th, which I've been reading a lot of this their, uh, report, they, they actually conceptualize the submerged land along the whole uh, coastal plain, of the, uh, along the whole world, especially the United States, as this uh, well, yeah, there's water there, but it's only, in geologic terms, it's only been there for a few hundred million years, you know, and, and, and there is this continental kind of shelf, and so, I mean, for, when you're dealing in geologic time, you know, it, it, it's kind of, it's kind of mythological time, it's, it's similar to geologic time in some ways, I don't, I mean, I don't, it's not really a question, it's kind of, this is, I saw the, I was walking by and saw the sign. I thought, well, yeah, they're trying, to, they're trying to understand how water works. I mean, in legal terms, they just choose to define it, but it, but it's impossible to separate those legal conceptions, I think, from the from the cultural and then from the and from the built and then also from just the whole conceptual. So like Delhi and Bombay, a lot of the Delhi Yamuna embankment built, like the Akshadham Temple and the mm -hmm. Games Village, is on reclaimed. On the flood width, and most of Bombay is on reclaimed land. So it's it's you know if you look at the floods and you look at what's happened in <coughs> Bombay to the river, it's like the water reclaims. It's, it's you know it's like water coming back to where it right. always belongs. Right. The longest thing is that this this drive to subjugate the water, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, to confine it, to Control. contain it, to dam it. You know, this goes right back to our old uh, Ramayana story. This is the famous. You know, seen it, the damming of the ocean, essentially, this Ram Setu so called project. Mm -hmm. But to do that, Rama has to physically, here, here the, the, the water is masculinized because it's the god of the water, Saga. It has to be terrorized into submission. And the water resists being contained, resists being crossed, refuses to be bridged. And Rama has to literally shoot the ocean and burn it, you know, and, and make it conform to, to, to the will of the people and monkeys, of course, <laughs> who actually <laughs> die in building bridge, right? <laughs> so, I mean, that, that idea is, is, is deeply ingrained. So one way of, of taking seriously the agent of nature of water, because what, as Lauren was saying, I mean, a larger part of art history or, or at least cultural studies has been about how man or the human dominated nature, but to take that, to take where water challenges, subverts, and remakes land or remakes the human is I think one way of thinking about this whole question of, of the relationship between the human and the natural yeah, or the sure. human and the non-human in that sense. That's what you want to ask. My question actually follows nicely on all of that, which is um, this idea of containment and, and how both water is contained or can contain things, uh, whether it's in a vessel or the banks or whatever. And I thought in each way, like each one of your presentations talked on that in some way. So I was curious, and particularly with the boat, I thought it was interesting because the boat is this container which kind of pushes water out, but then the water is kind of holding it. Um, so my question is, how does if you think of water being contained or water containing, if that shifts the aesthetic sensibility of water, and and how it might change? Like if, if we think of water as holding, does that change how we think about it aesthetically, or if we think of water as something that's held? Yeah. So I can say for in that in the in the case of the Hoover Dam, what's interesting to me is the way in which it's contained to produce dependable flow. Mm -hmm. Like so they get they have this the, the idea of the centrifugal uh, force mm -hmm. being being always the turbines. Been, but yeah, the turbines and this idea so this idea that containment is not to stop but to to get the energy mm -hmm. out that the water contains. 
So there's a kind of, uh, there's a strange relationship between, I think, the containment and the flow mm -hmm. that I haven't quite totally wrapped my mind around, but it's that the water should be contained so we can get what it contains, <laughs> which is the, the energy. But it speaks to all forms of uh, oppressive domination, you might say. <laughs> because that scene of the subjugation of the ocean becomes the occasion for that infamous line of Tulsidas in his version of the Ramayana. Mm -hmm. He then, when he cows the ocean, he's also again like in the river, he's a god as well as a natural object. And he says to his brother, he said, you see, Lakshmana, uh, certain, pe certain beings only cooperate when they're beaten. The drum, a donkey, a shudra, and a woman. Oh. So that's, you know, in other words, you're, you're met for Christ. All kinds of gender, caste, class, <laughs> subjugation is put under that, that heading. He makes it, that's a very, very famous and controversial line in a chopai of the... Uh, the idea of Kardena, I was you know, talking of the episode of the Mahabharata of Duryodhana going back mm -hmm. in, into the lake, which mm -hmm. is named right. again. Yeah. The Vyas names the lake for himself, that's right. why not. Mm. It contains mm -hmm. you, but it also, you want to be contained by it mm -hmm. as well. It's like going back into it. So it's like you have to kind of acknowledging that, you know, you can't do without what, what you from, yeah. right? So it's like we are 80% water anyway. So as a human being, any, any, any But to follow up on that question, I like that question because the idea is that the water is enabling, it's not being disciplined. I mean, if we think of it at another scale, that water is holding the boat or producing the boat. And uh, the question is actually really straightforward. In the early texts, is there a distinction made between an ocean and a river? Yes. So, so yes, it, I mean, it's, it's all water. It's a gender, and then no, no. A question it's of a gender process. distinction. But right? is there a question of agency? I mean, is the a gentle property of an ocean, which would which has no um, banks, for example. Mm -hmm. It's a different scale, and therefore it's holding the land. For, I mean, there are ways mm -hmm. to think mm -hmm. of it as mm -hmm. somehow enabling. Again, the, the bi-gender distinction is often there, because various epithets for the ocean are things like Lord of the Rivers, right? Sindhapati, so like the, 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 the feminine rivers run to the male uh, ocean. But you know your, uh, mm -hmm. that story, that the, the uh, Parashara story, is very interesting because it spins out. First of all, this uh, so-called Dashputi, right, this, uh, this woman, she actually comes out of a fish in the river, yeah. if you remember, right? This uh, so so there was a river called <laughs> Matsaganda, fish, yeah, fish thinking. Yeah. Fish, yeah, fish thinking. Right? Yeah. Fish thinking. But then she becomes then the <laughs> wife of Shantanu, becomes yeah. the dynasty. Yeah. But his other wife is Ganga, okay. right? So there's this constant obsession with literally screwing the rivers. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what I'm so interested coming off on her question is 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 the fresh water. Mm. It's you know, so whether this is a mention of the oceans and the rivers and because the feminine being fresh water and salt water. Yeah. Yeah. Salt water. I don't know, I mean it's something right. to look into. Mm -hmm. did, did, sorry, can I just ask if the Hoover Dam changed, like did the nature of the water change when it was some gigantic lake rather than a river? That's a good, yeah, that's an interesting question. So I haven't been, uh, Lake Mead is like, it's a big, and I think it's, so we ha we're having problems now that the lake is so low, oh, they're yeah. trying to figure out how to, how to deal with that. In, I mean, it's, so it's the nature, the nature of the water is that it's controlled so that you don't <laughs> get the same kind of flood. And it's actually mostly not in that valley anymore. It goes to LA, yeah. like it goes, massive distances and mm -hmm. it's used to farm in the Central Valley. So it's a, it became a huge infrastructural project that made that valley totally arid. The whole, the Owen Valley. Yeah. Was completely destroyed. Yeah. Huh. And all the native populations that live there are totally displaced. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it, the No, no, no. no but I think another, another aspect of containment flow that, that we could bring into this whole picture is the question of water itself changes. Mm -hmm. Water becomes mist, water becomes ice. Mm -hmm. And then we s when we start talking about 
containment, when what happens when water evaporates? Mm -hmm. And that is in a way that makes water a sort of both a metaphor, but really a physical form of that, 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 that sort of symptomizes flow, because it flows out of the surface as well. And I'm thinking about a whole range of recent works, of photographic projects in the Arctic Circle, thinking about the relationship between snow and, 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 and again, where God, how do you talk about snow? So that is perhaps, again, sort of brings up the question of flow in a much more complex way that even transcends the question of liquid. So from liquescent, can we talk about snow and how does that change the history of, of aesthetics? So those right. tubes are white in the photograph because they're, because they're frost, mm -hmm. because they're so cold. <coughs> and they show, so they show up so nice against the dark ground. But there's a, it's such a weird, the idea that it would be brine that would flow through, but then it would fix the earth because it would be cold enough to freeze the ground. Yeah. So then you wouldn't get a landslide while you're in the midst of building a massive dirt dam. So it's a, I, I get what you're saying about the relationship of flow and, and solidity. Right. Should, should I try to play that out? Um, yeah, sure. I, I'm all excited. It's very interesting. <laughs> um, but I went, so then I want to pivot to the one thing that we saw that offered no promise of a state change or um, change of scale, which was in your piece where you're mourning the lost water, you chose to dress all in black and then even suppress your mm -hmm. head so that it's just this solid, unmoving monolith in the image, and I just, maybe you could say a little bit more about that. So what is, so you're replacing this lost flow with something so uh, still. It's, no, it's, uh, maybe, maybe that's another way to look at it, but then that's an image, because when I was doing it, I mean, when you're doing it, you're not really conscious of this. You know, what's it going to look like, right? <laughs> so you just, because I take a help of another person to go and photograph me, right? Mm -hmm. So when you look at images, all of this, the other readings kind of come up, and then you, you know, okay, you know, what is going on? Is it, like somebody pointed out that, you know, you're there, but then maybe it's all about you. There's another reading. And then, like you said, like a monolith right there, and you know. But then it's also like a silhouette. You have to go look through it, because you're looking, and, the, and this is a potency to decide, because, you know, it's, it's about pointing to the side. So it's, you know, it's, it's like looking at, uh, the film through myself, yeah. well, I think you know, for me as an artist, uh, location, sight, a body as sight as well, is extremely important in how I navigate mm -hmm. what I'm interested in. So that's it's it's a, it's a it's a way to kind of get a point across. So I don't know, if I'm making sense, but and then sometimes your body is marked by the gravity of the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I uh, I think we talked a lot about uh, containing water in terms of dams or you know uh, reclaiming land and stuff like that. But what about water as containing uh, water as doing the containing? So you know, like uh, river boundaries or um, river rights, uh, which cause a lot of political problems. You know, like this side of the Mississippi versus that side of the Mississippi. In I don't know how you how kind of you can you know pull that together with. The water disappearing in terms of you know what you're saying the traffic making it easier for you know people to kind of come together in that sense, but also raising questions about you know identities and uh, so I don't know if, if that's something you know want to talk about. No, I mean there's a deep. I mean it's you know always. I mean this, this it just happened last week. I didn't have water for three days because the old jar agitation <laughs> in neighboring Haryana. Yeah. Yeah. I I was I was. I was without water for three days, and you know, it's, but it's there. And but, but it's not one doesn't address it directly. You know, I'm not gonna say most of my way of addressing it is is like leaving questions. You leave questions within the public domain. And most of these works are done in public. Domain. You kind of leave questions, but you leave questions for people to come to their own answers, and hopefully they come to the right answers. Right? You know, so, but then. I, I can't bang somebody on the head, but you know, you can't do this. That's not one way of doing it. Even though, I mean, I, that's why I don't want to, I don't call myself an activist, because some people do call me an activist, but I'd rather not call myself an activist. But that's something that I, I, I am involved in, but I use different methods to kind of get a point across. More like putting questions, maybe sometimes not much stickers as well.
last question. Okay, sure. Um, so you raised this issue of um, moving beyond aestheticization and this idea of the pristine in relation to waters. Um, and I think the idea of the pristine is often particularly <coughs> in the Indic context associated with the, um, the sacralization of waters and this history of mythology located in these ancient texts. Um, and I mean, if we think about it in the modern context, it also relates to, um, I think, is it Bob? Um, you mentioned loving the river, <laughs> literally loving yeah. the river to death, yeah. right? This association um, of uh, the sacred with the river and um, the pollution that comes with that. And I wonder if anyone would like to hypothesize about what would happen if there was a shift in the way that we talk about um, rivers in a pre-modern context and locating the mundane and how that would change the conversation around rivers. Um, I could, with, with sort of my work on the Yamuna, I mean my concern with the pristine cons is also my concern with uh, conservative political uh, mobilization of the natural landscape, and which is not necessarily located in India. It's globally there is a move to 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 think about nature in very very conservative forms, which mm -hmm. are problematic in terms of gender, problematic in terms of sexuality, problematic in terms of land rights. So in India, uh, the context that I work on, one has seen the mobilization of river systems by by right-wing forces precisely in the language of sacrality, in the language of sacredness. The, but the moment we talk about sacred rivers, my question is, who has access to that sacred mm -hmm. river? Mm -hmm. So I work on pre-modern South Asia. I'm interested in river systems that challenge the sort of the pristineness that is dictated by upper caste Brahmanical systems. So in thinking about the Yamuna, I'm interested in Muslim access to Yamuna, Muslim architecture on the Yamuna. So in a certain way, how certain conservative upper caste notions of nature are, are, are radicalized by other political forces. So in that sense, my discomfort with the pristine comes from a certain contemporary politics of nature. But Bob, do you want mm -hmm. to? No, this is a big issue in this question. I, the, 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 the varying access to resources to water and what kind of water you get now. You talk about the, you know, these guys shutting down the water in Delhi. Many people in Delhi, it's shut down all the time. Yeah. I mean, they, there's a clear you know, higher hierarchy. The elite people who actually don't go without water because they have giant tanks or something. Right, uh, and then you know, you look at the water uh, that comes out of some parts of the Delhi when it's coming and you think you were in Flint, Michigan, for example, mm -hmm. right? Because you have that same kind of thing where access to clean water, to pure water, is very much uh, indexed to social status because the people who are getting sick, poisoned in Flint are poor people, people of color, right? Uh, and the people in, uh, in Lansing, you know, the government, who, you know, they don't care because they set up this thing to save themselves. Something. So, so this is a very important issue. So who, who gets clean water, who doesn't get clean water, and who gets no water? I think part of your point, too, is that clean doesn't equal necessarily natural. Because the problem in right. Flint is that they went to the river, which was like super dirty, and also right. was basic, and or like was different than, exactly. Yeah, so exactly. So that, that they went to the river instead of the reservoir, because it was cheaper. But And it mm -hmm. was arguably more natural to go to a river than a reservoir, but it is mm -hmm. not clean. Right. So that to think about how the boundaries between, especially na big and nature, um, whether that helps us to think about our role as human or not, like in relationship to power. Right. And, and then the relationship between questions of justice and, and aesthetics. I think mm -hmm. that, that I, I would highlight the relation between, between questions of literary texts, between architectural practices, between performative practices, and the question of access to water, mm -hmm. both in the pre-modern times as well as today and Flint. And but on that note, we are supposed to wrap up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.